Like for instance, the treasure of San Miguel. Known as the 1551 shipwreck off the Santo Domingo is believed to be one of the richest treasure galleons ever lost at sea. Holding precious cargo from the Inca and Aztec that were looted by Spanish conquistadors, which tells me the ancestors of the Inca and Aztec conjured the spirits as karma for these European colonizers for what they did. A fleet of nine ships left Mexico on March 15, 1551, and by April 29, the San Miguel had wrecked off the north coast of the Santo Domingo. With no lives lost, some of the registered treasures appears to have been salvaged by the following months and was sent to Spain. The ship was 200 ton of lads and it was considered to be the best an excellent vessel as the best of the fleet and it had been about 23 meters long with a keel of nearly 15 meters. But the fact that the best of the best was lost possesses a lot of questions as to how. While many people have searched for the San Miguel and the search was mentioned in the final chapters of a non-fiction recount book called Pirate Hunters where John Chatterton and John Matera were the first lead divers who found the pirate ship of the Golden Fleece. Feeling that they were close to the trail of the San Miguel, they continued for a decade of simply searching for the legendary ship. Going as far as digging historical records in Spain and Jack Haskin to locate the specific area of the San Miguel was last seen and had where it sunk. Chatterton and Matera had spent the last years narrowing down the lost ship's location, and to this day the search is still ongoing in the treacherous waters of the Dominican Republic. The Holy Grail in quote, the Grail legendary is a literary invention of the 12th century with no historical basis, according to Carlos de Ayala. The medieval historian at the Madrid University told AFP news agency that you cannot search for something that does not exist, but according to the Valencia Cathedral houses in Spain, might hold a relic that might have been the holy chalice used by Jesus at the Last Supper. It has been the right size, material, as well as history, yet despite the grill's fame, no one really entirely knows where it is or if it ever existed. But of course in Spain, they believe that it is a real thing. It has said that the grill had miraculous powers and could heal any wound as well grant immortality. These divine attributes therefore made it popular across the world and made the searches even more intense. The Holy Grail is considered one of the greatest treasures in Christianity, and it is said to be the cup that Jesus drank from the Last Supper and also the cup used by Joseph of Arimathea to collect the blood of Jesus. Such a cup is sure to be special, which is why humans have not stopped looking for it since the legend first originated. As for the location, some say the Knights of Templar had it in their possession and hid it somewhere unknown. In fact, there are now several cups claiming to be the original Holy Grail in different locations around the world, which comes from a very convincing story as to how the Grail got there. Including the Valencia Cathedral in Spain, it also said to be located in Santa Maria, de Monastrat, Catalonia, Spain, as well as Sinai House Park in Burton-on-Trent, England. Where do you think the Holy Grail is? And personally, I think it's on a shelf on a stockpile waiting to be found on an episode of Storage Wars. Little is known by Sappho's life, she was from a wealthy family from Lesbos, although her family and parents specifically names are uncertain. Ancient sources say that she had three brothers, Cherokox, uh, uh, Lerikos, and Eurigios. Two of them, Cherokox and Lerikos, are mentioned in the brother's poem discovered in 2014. I am so sorry if I butchered that, by the way. She was exiled to Sicily around 600 BC and may have been continued to work around 570 BC. According to legend, she took her own life by leaving being off a cliff due to her unrequited love for a fairy man named Phaeon. Of course, I relate, I also have an unrequited love for a fairy man named Phaeon. Sappho is known for her lyric poetry written to be sung while accompanied in music. In ancient times, Sappho was widely regarded as one of the greatest lyric poets and was given names such as Tenth Muse and the Poetess. Most of Sappho's poetry is now lost though. What is extent as most survived by fragmentary form only to the Ode of Aphrodite is certainly completed. As well as her lyric poetry and ancient commentators claim that Sappho wrote Elegaic and imbabic poetry, as Sappho was a prolific poet, composing probably around 10,000 lines. She was best known in the antiquity for her love of poetry. Other themes in the surviving fragments of her work included family and religion. She probably wrote poetry for both individual and choral uh, performances. Most of her best known and best preserved fragments explore personal emotions and were probably composed for solo performances. Her works are also known for their clarity of language and vivid images and urgency, and the last surviving copies of her poems transmitted directly from ancient times are written on parchment codex pages from the 6th and 7th century AD and were surely reproduced from ancient papyruses now unfortunately are lost. Number 7, mummies for sale. Considering the frenzy that people get into when archaeologists discover a new mummy, you might be surprised to learn that this picture is actually a street merchant selling mummy merchandise of actual actual mummy. During the Victorian era in the 1800s, Napoleon's conquest opened the gates of Egypt to the Europeans, making mummies a really hot commodity. Like imagine somebody bury like uh, uncovering your aunt and going, "Ooh, we could sell her." 
weird, right? Like thousand years from now? They could be purchased from street vendors, just as you see from this photo. The Euro elite used to even have mummy unwrapping parties, which is exactly as it sounds and not what you would expect people to do with a corpse. But even weirder than that, people actually thought ground up mummies had medicinal properties. It was so popular that it even instigated a counterfeit trade to meet the massive demand for magic mummy ground stuff. What did the counterfeit trade involve? The flesh of beggars instead of mummies. All that behind one picture. Number six, half and half. This next one actually has a kind of sad story behind it, but paints a very clear picture of the division between Catholics and Protestants and actually just religion in general. This picture depicts two graves in the Netherlands, one belonging to a Protestant and the other a Catholic. In 1842, a 22-year-old Catholic noblewoman fell passionately in love with a 33-year-old commoner, a colonel in the cavalry who was also Protestant, a big no-no. Their marriage was a total scandal, but they said screw you to their peers and stayed together for 40 years. The woman's husband died in 1880 and to forever unite them, she built a grave that would forever keep them together even though they were apart by a wall. The old cemetery was strictly divided into Catholic, Protestant and Jewish sections so these two monuments were built so they could forever be together. Does anybody have a tissue? Number 5. Leo the Lion. Believe it or not, you've seen this lion before. In fact, you've probably seen him many times while watching your favorite films as a kid and even now. The lion in the photo is the one, the only, Leo the Lion, the majestic beast who roars the MGM logo, like the old one. Leo the Lion was the regular star of MGM since it was founded in 1924. The first MGM lion was called Slats, not Leo, and he actually didn't roar, he was just kind of like looking around, it was more like a gif. But Leo is actually the most familiar roar, like everybody knows what he sounds like. But who is the man having tea with such a lion? Well that of course is Alfred Hitchcock, the king of thrills. This photo was taken in 1957 of the two legends posing to enjoy a hot cup of British tea. Number 4, Walter Yeo. Though the picture itself is a little disturbing, it signifies a life changing moment for Mr. Walter Yeo and also for thousands more. This was one of the world's first plastic surgery procedures. Walter Yeo had suffered a dreadful accident while manning the guns on the HMS Warspite during World War I. He lost both his upper and lower eyelids in the event. A year later, however, he met Sir Harold Gillies, who would be considered the father of plastic surgery. His idea was to take skin from another part of Yeo's body and place it over the area in like a mask-like shape, as you can see in the photo. Dr. Gillies then went on to carry out the surgery on 5,000 injured men from June. 1917 onward. And thanks to his work, thousands of people have benefited since the years of the war. Yeo himself lived until he was 70 years old. Number three, the Dynosphere. The car of the future that really never made it there, and we can see why. Every car we have today has four wheels, not just one. Some have more than that now, it's getting confusing. But in the 1930s, J.H. Purvis had a vision. He called it the Dynosphere. It was a large wheel with a cabin in the center for the driver and the passenger to sit. Funny enough, it did actually work. Check this out. But did anyone else notice the problem with driving it? Yeah. You have to drive like Ace Ventura with his window open because it broke, you know what I mean that scene? Exactly. In order to see past the giant wheel spinning in front of you, you have to kind of rubber neck it out to the side. JH made two prototypes, one ran on gasoline and the other ran on electricity. He even designed a kind of bus version that could fit more passengers, but it still needed mini stabilizer wheels, so it had like six by the end of it. Do I kind of want one though, because it looks fun? Absolutely. Would I want to take it on a road trip across Canada? Absolutely not. Number two, the Hindenburg disaster. Based off the title, you already know that this is a picture of the Hindenburg disaster because I already said it. Spoiler alert. The Hindenburg was the largest dirigible ever built and it was the pride of World War II. Yeah, see, Germany, you know which one I'm talking about. The, but YouTube gets mad. The first successful airship was constructed in 1852 by Henry Giffard, but the problem was he used hydrogen. This made both French and German designs of the craft susceptible to explosions if something went wrong. Hence, exhibit A. What you are seeing in the photo is the direct aftermath of a devastating accident. Um, 
On May 6, 1937, the dirigible touched a mooring mast in Lakehurst, New Jersey, sparking the explosion, which took the lives of 13 passengers and 21 crew members. Something as simple as a small spark from the engine ignited the hydrogen core, and the craft fell 200 feet to the ground in flames. And last but not least, number one, spectators. This is the photo taken at the trial of Al Capone. Yeah, it suddenly makes a lot of sense as to why people are covering their faces. When someone says to you 1930s gangster, Al Capone probably jumps into your head. He was deemed public enemy number one by the US government for bootlegging and other illegal rackets during Prohibition. The terror the ruthless gangster incited in the city of Chicago is evident by this image. Witnesses and spectators of the trial covered their faces so they wouldn't be recognized by Capone's vengeful accomplices or Capone himself. Behind those fedoras may lie other criminals yet to be unmasked, or civilians scared of a Tommy gun waking them up at night. Either way, you know he must have been one terrifying dude. Authorities did everything they could to catch him, but he would always slip right through their fingers. Finally, his reign came to an end in 1931 when they caught him on income tax evasions of all things that landed him an eight year sentence. In most cases, in the typical traditional Roman family, Roman women were closely identified with their perceived role in society, especially their role in caring for the family as the main nurturer. In particular, giving birth to legitimate children, a consequence which would be bestowed onto them as soon as they begin menstruating. Typically before the age of 18, they would be married very early as a way of insurance for their future husband, as she would be pure and untouched by any other man. The Roman family was male dominated and typically headed by a senior male figure like the father or the grandfather. Women were always acted in subordination as it was reflected in their naming practices. Males had three names while all women in the same family were referred to using the feminine version of the family name. A married woman could keep her maiden name or just be referred to by using her husband's name which is a tradition that is commonly used today in today's society. As a lot of women today when marrying tend to take their partner's last name, turns out that in other religions and cultures that's not always the case, which proves it was a Roman tradition that passed down worldwide. When it came to legal rights, there hasn't been enough research on the societal discrepancies of a woman's right in Roman culture. However, unlike ancient Egypt, Rome did not regard women as equal to men before the law. They received only a basic education, if any at all. They were subject to the authority of a man. Traditionally, this was their father before marriage. At that point, authority switched to their husband, who also had the legal rights over their children. However, by the first century AD, women had much more freedom to manage their own businesses and financial affairs. Unless she had married in Manu, or in other words, in her husband's control, which conferred the bride and all of her property onto the groom and his family. Women could own, inherit, and dispose of property. Traditionally, these women who had married Sini Manu, meaning she was without her husband, control was still under the control of her pater familias, had been obliged to keep a guardian or a tutela until they had died. By the time of Augustus, if a woman has three children or a freed woman with four, they could become legally independent as a status known as sui iuris. When it came to work, it depended on the woman. In reality, the degree of freedom a woman enjoyed depended largely on her wealth and social status. A few women ran their own businesses, as one woman was a lamp maker or had careers as midwives, hairdressers, or doctors, but these were pretty rare. On the other hand, female slaves were common and filled a huge variety of roles, from lady maids to farm workers and even gladiators. When we think of ancient Roman gladiators, we tend to stereotype and think of them as just men warriors or slaves, but interestingly enough, female slaves were also forced into the pit to fight alongside their male counterparts, or as Emperor Domitian preferred, to pit them against against dwarves or his particular entertainment. Women fought in gladiator fights for 200 years until Emperor Septimus Severus banned their participation from these bloodthirsty games. Women who chose a life in the arena, as it does not seem that it was a choice, may have been motivated by a desire for independence, a chance at fame, and financial rewards including remission of debt. Although it seems a woman gave up any claim of respectability as soon as she entered the arena, there is some evidence to suggest the female gladiators were honored as highly as their male counterparts. The brave, strong Roman gladiators not only had their strength to put them in the pit, but also their swords. The type of armor and weapons they fought with depended on their social ranking as a gladiator, wealthy widows, as a subject to no man's authority, were independent as well. Other wealthy women chose to become priestess, of which is the most important were the Vestal Virgins. They had a lot of influence, but not the choice to construct decisions in a form of politics within law. Wealthy as some of them were, because they could not vote or stand for office, women had no formal role in the public life. In reality, wives or close relatives of prominent men could have political influence behind the scenes and exert real albeit informal power. In public, though, 
though women were expected to play their traditional role in the household. They were responsible for spinning and weaving yarn and making clothes, as these are usually typically made from wool and linen, although wealthy women, those whose servants made the clothes, were often dressed in expensive imported fabrics like Chinese silk or Indian cotton. Women were expected to be the dignified wife and the good mother and while all these rules could be bent, they couldn't be broken. As an example, Julia was the daughter of Emperor Augustus and was renowned as a clever, vivacious woman with a sharp tongue. However, Augustus was traditional and insisted that Julia spin and weave like a plebeian woman to demonstrate her wifely virtues. This was unfortunate because wifely virtues was not her strength. In fact, Julia had a series of lovers and many people knew this. Augustus, who was socially very conservative, was furious and so he denounced her in public and banished her for the rest of her life. Life. There were limits even for the emperor's daughter. One of the earliest influential female role models in the Roman Republic was Cornelia, daughter of famed Roman general Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. Well educated and raised in the house of a military political leader, she emerged as an intelligent presence in Roman society during her marriage and as a young widow. She spurned offers of marriage, including one from the Egyptian pharaoh uh, Ptolemy VIII. Instead of devoting herself to raising her three surviving children, when her two sons, the Gracchi brothers, whom she called her jewels, later embarked the populist reforms where she backed them sconchly into public, while guiding and sometimes chiding them into her letters. May Jupiter not for the single instant allow you to continue these actions nor permit such madness to come into your mind, which she wrote to her younger son Gaius uh, Sempronius Gaius. Both sons were assassinated though by a conservative Roman faction, but Cornelia retained widespread awe and respect both for her learning and her devotion to family and state. The influence of these women were only going so far, as the pater familias had the right to decide whether to keep newborn babies. After birth, the midwife placed babies on the ground, only if the patria family picked it up as the baby formally accepted into the family. If the decision went the other way, the baby was exposed as deliberately abandoned outside, and this usually happened to deformed babies, or when the family, or when the father, did not think the family could support another child. Babies were exposed into specific areas and places, and it was assumed that an abandoned baby would be picked up and taken as a slave. Even babies accepted into the household of Pater Familias had a rocky start in life. Around 25% of babies in the first century AD did not survive their first year, and up to half of all children would die before the age of 10. Do you know anything about breaking down codes? Well, the Beale ciphers are a set of three ciphertexts, one of allegedly states the location of a buried treasure of gold, silver, and jewels estimated to be worth over $43 million as of January 2018. Comprising three ciphertexts, the first unsolved text described the location, the second solved ciphertext accounts the content of the treasure, and the third unsolved lists the names of the treasure owners and their next of kin. The story of the three ciphertexts originated from an 1885 pamphlet called the Beale Papers, detailing treasures being buried by a man named Thomas J. Beale in a secret location in Bedford County, Virginia in about 1820. Beale entrusted a box containing the encrypted messages to a local innkeeper named Robert Morris and then disappeared, never to be seen again. According to the story, the innkeeper opened the box 23 years later and decades after giving him the three encrypted ciphertext to a friend before he died. The friend then spent the next 20 years of his life trying to decode the message and was able to only solve one of them, which gave details of the treasure buried and the general location of the treasure. The unnamed friend then published all three ciphertexts in a pamphlet, which was advertised for sale in the 1880s. But hey, do you think this is actually a real treasure or was he just having fun? I'm sure you'd know a little bit about the Fabergé eggs, but did you know that there were about 69 created and only 57 that survived? A Fabergé egg is a jeweled egg created by a jewelry firm House of Fabergé in St. Petersburg, Russia. Virtually all that were manufactured under the supervision of Peter Carl Fabergé between 1885 and 1917. And the most famous of his 52 imperial eggs, 46 of those, survived, especially as they were made for the Russian Emperor Alexander III and Nicholas II as Easter egg gifts for their wives and mothers. Fabergé eggs are worth millions of pounds and have become symbols of opulence as there are many times of eggs Peter's made like Catherine the Great Egg are now stored in Hillwood Museum, Peter the Great Egg as it's found in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in the US, and Catch China Palace Egg is also in the museum in Maryland, US. As for the ones lost as they still remain a mystery if they are still intact or unfortunately destroyed but what do you think? After all these unique looking eggs hold a lot of value as they were carefully crafted and intended to look fragile as well as bold in stature and design. But to be honest my favorite egg is the most impressive egg of all and that is Egg Boy. The legend of the lost Inca gold begins in the 16th century when the Los Inca Empire in the western South America was given away to European invaders. 
Atahalupa was an Inca king who, after warring with his half brother Hauscar for the control of the empire, was captured in his palace by a Camerica in a modern day Peru by Spanish commander Francisco Pizarro. They were more shocked when Hatapalupa delivered on his promise gold and silver began arriving daily, brought by the Inca subjects. Later, the sacking of the cities such as Cusco uh, earned the greedy Spaniards even more gold, and the Inca were fond of the gold and silver as they used it for ornaments and decorations for their temples and palaces, as well as for their own personal jewelry. Many objects were made of solid gold as Emperor Atahalupa had a portable throne of 15 karat gold that reportedly weighed 183 pounds. The Inca was one of the tribes of the many regions before they began conquering and assimilating their neighbors. Gold and silver have been demanded as tribute for vassal of cultures as the Inca also practiced basic mining. Which is pretty cool. As the Andes Mountains and the rich in minerals and the Incans accumulated a great deal of gold and silver by the time the Spaniards arrived, most of it was in the form of jewelry, adornments, decorations, and artificials from various temples. Although there are suspicions that these masses of gold are hidden somewhere on the planet, and that doesn't keep people from looking for these lost treasures or at least hoping that they're still out there. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Unless you're the Florentine diamond, you may never be found again. The yellow 137 carat Florentine diamond was likely from India that may have made its way to Europe by the end of the 15th century. How and when it got to Europe is a matter of debate. One story is that Charles the Bold was the Duke of Burgundy from 1467 to 1477, which he had a cut from a larger diamond that was so enamored by the, with the Florentine diamond that he even carried it with him into battle and was supposedly killed with it. After World War I, the last emperor of Austria-Hungary, Charles I fled with it to to Switzerland and where he put it back into a bank vault and entrusted it to an Austrian lawyer named Bruno Steiner, who was supposed to help with the deposit of the royal's family as selling it with other royal jewels, as wrote of a historian Gordon Brooke Shepherd in the book Uncrowned Emperor, The Life and Times of Otto von Hasburg. It's unclear what happened next though, as a news report published in 1924 indicated that Steiner was arrested and charged with fraud and acquitted. It's possible that the Florentine diamond was recut and now is a series of smaller diamonds. Although we are fully aware of the existence of Cleopatra, but what about her tomb? Ongoing investigations and excavations and explorations of the temple in the ancient ruined city of the Egyptian coast, Kathleen Martinez of the University of Santo Domingo in Dominican Republic and colleagues uncovered a structure of 13 meters below ground. The two meter tall tunnel had been weighed through an incredible 1,305 meters of sandstone and it's still unclear whether or not this is Cleopatra's tomb. But they're still researching it, but we'll see. Nimrod is a ancient Assyrian city located in Iraq. Currently, the tombs of some of the great queens have been uncovered in the palace of Nimrod, buried underneath the floor of the harem with a wonderful collection of treasures and gold and other precious metals, also dubbed as the treasures of Nimrod. The treasures of Nimrod unearth of these excavations collections of 613 pieces of gold jewelry, precious stones, and it survived a confusion and looting after the invasion of Iraq in 2003 in a bank vault where it had been put away for 12 years, and then it was rediscovered on June 5, 2003. The tomb contained four magnificent gold bowls, three of them inscribed with names of different queens, and there were two bodies with three inscribed bowls as one was inscribed of the name of Yaba, the second with the name of Atelia, the wife of Sargon II, they may have been mother and daughter of both of them being queens. The third was inscribed with the name of Manitou, the wife of Shamlamenser V, whose bowl had been inherited by her successors. By command of the great gods of the underworld, mortal destiny caught up with Queen Yaba in death as she traveled with the path of her ancestors, who were in time to come, whether a queen who sits on the throne or a lady of the palace who is favored concubine of the king, removes herself from the tomb or anyone else with her lays hands on her jewelry or evil intent or breaks open the seal of the tomb, let their spirit wander on the thirst of the open countryside. But I don't know, do you think this curse is real or was she just messing with you? And finally, the story of the Kelly Gang, released in Australia in 1906, is regarded as many of the world's first featured length film. Running over an hour long, the movie depicted the story of a 19th century outlaw, Ned Kelly and his gang. The film was such a huge success that film historians Sally Jackson and Graham Shirley wrote in an article on the National Film and Sound Archives of Australian websites. Yet few of the 1906 could have been predicted the impact moving images were going to have on a global culture stage, and no one has ever Ever thought about their preservation either. Despite ranking in thousands of pounds and being celebrated as a landmark of Australian film, by the end of the Second World War, all known prints of the story and the movie had vanished. 
Despite the film's commercial success, by the mid 1940s, it was thought to be lost to history. The first remnants were <laughs> the first remnants resurfaced in 1976 when Adelaide film collector Vic Reeve found five short fragments in a collection he had acquired some years previously, and the longest was only 11 frames long from a 35 millimeter nitrate release print. Friends and colleagues of Ron Prait used a publicity photo from the film to identify the frames. But hey, where do you think the movie is? And do you think Netflix would claim streaming rights if they were able to find it? Eh, it depends. After all, all these items are all so starting us off at number 10 is Phantom Clouds and Darkness. Nebula IRAS 05437 plus 2502 doesn't have a very catchy name. These are NASA experts after all. As we learned from Elon Musk, their naming creativity even for literal offspring doesn't go much further than point and pick some numbers and letters. But it does certainly look like it's a surrealist painting to say the least. I could honestly get lost in the layers, arches, and rolling clouds that create an almost religious image was just how awe-inspiring it is. Staring at it long enough, you may see a phantom rising up from the back of the dust clouds, or an angelic figure at the top of the floating yet mountainous staircase with an arched entryway. NASA and ESA's Hubble Space Telescope took this image in 2010, but scientists are still unsure what causes the bright glowing arc near the center. Maybe it's truly divine. Number 9 is, well it's hard to find words, but its name is the Gaping Maw. Ew, don't like that personally. Anyways, it's specifically the gaping maw of a sunspot. The sun is an active place with filaments, holes, and flares that are constantly shifting across its face like a pool of liquid magma. That what you see is a close up look at a very dramatic sunspot as seen by the Big Bear Solar Observatory's telescope in 2010. This gape could be compared to a few things. Maybe the toothy opening of the Sarlacc pit in Star Wars, or if you fired a bullet through a grapefruit like the Mythbusters. I can tell you from my very unfortunate experience that this is also kind of what it's like to look into a puncture wound on the human body and see the tissue inside. No matter what you see, I'm sure it's something uncomfortable enough that you just want me to move on. So I will. Number 8 is Ghostly Hand. I'm not even a Marvel fan and their franchise is what I thought of when I saw this picture. It's giving Scarlet Witch or Doctor Strange or even Morgan Le Fay, which if you've seen the recent video historic sorcerers that actually had powers, you'd know is a character of Arthenian legend found in the Marvel Strike Force comic series The Odd Replause will be playing on the big screen. If you haven't seen that video, maybe check it out. And while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe to The Hive. Anyways, this ghostly hand was caused by a pulsar lurking in the center, which to quote, is a rapidly spinning neutron star, which is spewing energy out into the space around it to create complex and intriguing structures, including one that resembles a large cosmic hand, according to NASA, who snapped the picture in 2009 with their Chandra X-ray observatory. Thanks to the pulsar, a disembodied phantom-like hand looks to be grasping at the void. When it came to unions, there was specific laws governing marriage. A proper Roman marriage would not take place unless the bride and groom were Roman citizens or had been granted special permission called the unconcubium. At one point, the Roman history of freed slaves had been forbidden to marry citizens. This restriction was relaxed by Emperor Augustus, who passed a reform in 18 BC called the Lex Julia, so that the first century freed slaves were only prohibited from marrying senators. Augustus insisted on the restriction of marriage as citizens were not allowed to marry adult workers or actresses, and provincial officials were not allowed to marry the local woman. Soldiers were were only allowed to marry in certain circumstances, and marriages to close relatives were forbidden. Finally, unfaithful wives divorced their husbands could also not remarry. While ancient Roman society was dominated by men, the pantheon of Roman gods were not. Of the three supreme deities worshipped by ancient Romans, only one, Jupiter, the king of the gods, were male. The other two were Juno, chief goddesses and protectress of the empire, and Minerva, Jupiter's daughter and the goddess of wisdom and war. Roman divorce was just as simple as marriage, just as marriage was of a declaration of intent to live together, divorce was just a declaration of a couple intent not to live together. All that the law required was that they declared their wish to divorce before seven witnesses because marriages could be ended so easily. Divorce was actually pretty common, particularly in the upper class. When she filed for divorce, a wife could expect to receive her dowry back in full and would then return to Patria Potesia, a protection of her father. If she had been independent before her wedding, she would also regain her independence upon divorce. Under the Lex Julia, a wife found guilty of adultery in a special court might sacrifice the return of half of her dowry. However, the law did not recognize adultery by husbands after all Roman society it was very much a man's world. And finally, the Vestal Virgins lived in the temple of Vestia in Rome. Vestia was the native Roman goddess of the fireplace, and the six virgins tended to the sacred fire, baked in sacred salt cakes, aka mola salsa, and oversaw the care of the sacred objects in the temple. Young girls from some of the Romans' best families were chosen to be virgins by the Pontifex Maximus. Starting between the ages of 6 and 10, they had to reserve 30 years, but most continued to help out even after they had left. The priestess' religious significance gave them unusual power and 
influence, and they occasionally used it as when they intervened to save young Caesar from the dictator Sulla. They were also expected to remain virgins and face severe penalty if it was discovered that they lost their chastity, they would also be buried alive. Which when it comes to history, it was a very intense time. Number 10, Amelia Earhart. An American aviation pioneer and celebrated figure in the early 20th century, Amelia Earhart was the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Notably, in 1932, she became the first woman to fly solo non-stop across the Atlantic Ocean, covering a distance of over 2,000 miles from Newfoundland, Canada to Northern Ireland. Beyond her aviation achievements, Earhart was a prominent advocate for women's rights. She encouraged women to pursue careers and goals that were traditionally considered to be male-dominated. Earhart was also an author and a, pub and a popular public speaker. Which which I wish I could do. And she wrote several books about her experience in aviation and women's issues. In this photo, what seems to be a normal photo of Amelia is actually the last photo we have of her before she went missing. She may have survived her round the world attempt only to be later captured by Japanese forces. According to a newly discovered photograph, and according to the New History Channel documentary, the photo is found in a National Archive file as it is shown Earhart alive after her plane fell low on fuel during her mission. The photo depicts a woman believing to be Earhart and a man who looked like her navigator, Fred. A Japanese ship can be seen in the background, carrying what appears to be her plane, as her fate has been debated for decades and has sparked several conspiracy theories. Mona, what do you guys think? Are people just hopeful? Number 9. Volcano We all love a good nature tour or park hike, but for this man, David Johnston, he really loved the nature of volcanoes and geology, and ultimately pursued his education in the field. He was working with the US Geological Survey at the Cascades Volcano Observatory in Vancouver, Washington, and he was assigned to monitor the activity of Mount St. Helens, a stratovolcano that had been and showing recently a lot of activity. This photo is when he was doing his research on the earthly giant, but tragically on May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted explosively, triggering a massive landslide and a pyroclastic flow. David Johnston was stationed at the observation post on the ridge known as Coldwater 2, about six miles north of the volcano. He radioed in the now famous message, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it, to his colleagues at the USGS headquarters, alerting them to the eruption. Regrettably, Johnston's post was directly in the path of the advancing pyroclastic flow and he perished in the eruption alongside with many others. His body was unfortunately never recovered and he was only 30 years old. Number 8, the 1986 Challenger. I love space and I think space is really amazing and cool as so did these guys, the crew members of the Challenger. Francis R. Scooby, Michael J. Smith, Ronald McNair, Alison Onezuka, Judith Resnick, Gregory Jarvis, and Christina McAuliffe. The Challenger mission was unique because it included Christina, a civilian school teacher who was selected to be the first private citizen to fly in space as part of NASA's Teacher in Space program. However, the Challenger suffered a massive disaster when the failure of an O-ring seal in the right solid rocket booster. Cold temperatures in the morning of the launch weakened the O-ring's elasticity, allowing hot gases to escape and damage the external fuel tank, leading to an explosion that was witnessed by millions of people around the world, and it was a devastating blow to NASA and the space program. Following the disaster, the space shuttle program was suspended for over two years, and significant changes were made to the shuttle's design and launch protocols. After its investigation, the disaster also led to a renewal focus on the importance of safety in human spaceflight. Calling all the ancient astronauts, number seven will be about the thigh bone. As you can imagine, this picture you see on screen caused quite a kerfuffle online after NASA released the image in 2014. Understandably so, because this appears to be a thigh bone smack dab in the middle of Mars. NASA, who's just so tired of us and likely assumed that this would happen, pretty much instantaneously released a statement that no, this is not a human or an alien or whatever's thigh bone. This is apparently just a rock that very conveniently eroded by wind or water to look like that. Because notoriously, there's lots of wind and water on Mars. Literally. Anyway, sorry folks, no alien burial grounds are on Mars if we want to believe the space people company. Number six, we get to check out the Skull Nebula, which to me looks like a circle. I don't know, I'm not very sold, but apparently this bad boy creeps a lot of folks out. The Skull Nebula is a consistent in our galaxy, built up of several stars doing an elaborate orbital dance, in the words of NASA. This particular picture was taken in 2020. What earned it the skull name was obviously its ghastly colors, reminiscent of, well, a flayed human skull. The telescope's view highlights of the nebula's hydrogen in red and oxygen content, which is light blue. Also, if you kind of turn your head to the left like this and look at it sideways, you can kind of see the two stars sitting in what's arguably 
completely the eye sockets, a thick red cloud making up the nose, and the empty space where cheeks are meant to be surrounding teeth. So what do you think? Spooky scary skeleton or space dodgeball? Next up is what you probably see when you die. It's number five, the carbon star. This one, unlike the last, kind of got me. It seemed unassuming at first, but the longer you stare in the little orange glow of the void, the more you pick up. The hexagonal patterns of mist, the layers and colors, it all amounts into a tunnel of sheer oblivion reminiscent to light speed and Star Wars. I feel like if you drink a little bit of funky tea and pull this picture up on a laptop, you could possibly discover the meaning of the universe somewhere in it. Dare you to try if you're brave. This baleful orange eye is Carbon Star C.W. Lewis as seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. NASA and the European Space Agency captured this image in 2021 as the star collapsed inwards upon itself and died. More ghastly figures of the sky. Let's do Ghost Nebula for number four. Another entrancing surrealist painting-esque image. This photo captured in 2018 by the Hubble Space Telescope is depicting the ghost nebula that haunts the constellation of Cassiopeia. It's absolutely beautiful, it's spectral-like appearance coming from a veil of swirling gases and dusts. As mentioned, it really does have the cadence of a surrealist painting. To give you comparison, this untitled piece by Salvador Dali shows textures, tones, and shifting lines I personally find reflective and even haunting about this particular space formation. Even if humans cannot see such things as the ghost nebula with our own two eyes, as we stand on Earth with our own two feet, the connection between man and the divine above has always shown through in art. How we spent so long staring up at the wonders above us that even unwittingly, without ever truly seeing them, we've always found ways to capture and convey the sky, the stars, and their artistic fluidity into something two-dimensional, such as the wisps of a surrealist painting. And now we're incredibly lucky to capture these beautiful space formations, such as the Ghost Nebula, in images like the one I can show you today. Number three will have you ready to sing, This is Halloween. It's a jack-o'-lantern sun. Isn't that the funnest thing you've ever seen? though, and while it may look like an impressive feat of Photoshop, this is actually a purely natural phenomena. Similar to our earlier gaping maw, still such an ew name, this jack-o'-lantern face is the result of a series of active regions on the sun bursting and bubbling, making what appears to be a cosmic pumpkin carving appear on the sun. Or maybe it was the work of Jack Skellington. For number two, we're going to stare into the scariest void of all, the eye of a typhoon. This is our Earth, the one we're on right now, obviously. And and in March of 2015, Typhoon Masak, also called Typhoon Shedang, went spent a week ravaging the Philippines, killing five and injuring dozens. During that time, astronauts at the International Space Station were able to look down upon the Category 5 storm, prompting the European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti to capture the horrifying image you see on screen. The power of the formation is visible even from the safe distance of space as rain and lightning hide behind the deadly swirl. And coming in at number one is Space Station after dark. While it could arguably be a still from Insidious 16, the Space Spectre, this nightmare picture is actually just part of the European Space Agency's astronauts Alexander Gerst's photo series, which he naturally chose to make about, no, 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 not pretty stars or colors or Earth cloud rotations, nah, 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 nah. His collection was the International Space Station at night, which evidently is horrifying, but Gerst had been up in space for a full year at this point, so I mean, to him, this was bread and butter, baby, or maybe freeze-dried bread and butter. The main photo I'd like to address is the empty space suits with covers over the helmets, which look like a good start to a horror film. Honestly, maybe I never recovered from that alien horror film life, but space just isn't for me. Thank you so much for tuning in and taking this journey with me. As I mentioned, I do advise taking some time to rewind or pause to truly appreciate these photos, as many of them are incredibly stunning. Starting off with S for Secrets. Alrighty, so here is from the Polish Constitution Day celebration in Chicago, specifically the one from 1978. On the left there, all washed out and crappy old flash display style is First Lady Rosalind Carter. The guy shaking her hand, or rather just holding it and staring off camera like a waiter just went by with a tray of warm sausage rolls he wants to really get into, is John Wayne Gacy. And if you're also thinking, yo, what is up with this guy being in so many random famous photos, you're absolutely right, and it's genuinely strange how photographed and out there Gacy was. By the time this was taken, he had already killed over 20 people. Also, when he wasn't side hustling as a clown, he was super active in the government and politics, thus why wearing the S on the lapel. It was given to him by the Secret Service to indicate special security clearance. So the S literally does stand for secrets, both the US government and his own. Whose secrets are worse though, huh? 
Huh? Anyways, at the bottom of the handshake photo, you can see the handwritten address to John Gacy. Best wishes, Rosalind Carter. I've heard Beauty is Pain, but I haven't heard Beauty is the next Saw movie? Check out the Beauty Calibrator. Seeing pictures, you may think it's some sort of Middle Ages torture machine, or as said, literally one of those Saw movie head devices. But surprisingly not, it's another way to point out women's insecurities and find the smallest things possible to make them feel bad over. Meet the Max Factor Beauty Calibration Machine. It is the only one in existence thank God, and in 1932, the makeup legend Max Factor came up with this ingenious invention combining fearonology, cosmetics, and insecurity gaslighting with pseudoscience analysis of a woman's physical flaws. Max Factor's beauty calibrator enabled Hollywood makeup artists to pinpoint where facial corrections needed to be made down to a literal fraction. The machine, also known in the trades as the beauty micrometer, revealed that a natural perfect face was a myth. Every single woman was imperfect and needed correction, and this machine could find it by taking precise measures. It would mark spots that needed to be fixed and then the artist, once the helmet was removed, could correct all the new insecurities with makeup that you didn't have before you put the stupid thing on. Next up is a photo that's all dramatic flair, the death card. Masseria represented an outdated mindset in the mafia world, one that could no longer be reasoned with diplomatically. The same is true of his rival, Maranzano. The ongoing tit for tat killing between the two genuinely wreaked havoc on not only the streets but in the mafia hierarchy itself. Those resistant to change generally don't last long, and meetings of the Mafia elite tried to bring around at the end of bloodshed, but Maranzano especially consistently manipulated matters to his own advantage. In order to facilitate underworld peace, the consensus turned from diplomacy to the inevitable. One of these guys had to go. The final straw, according to the account of Nicola Gentile, was when the police informants called Masiri and said knock off the violence. Having an idealism for peace, he actually responded by disarming his men, and they were all pissed. Joe the boss, Masiri, his bodyguards, and Lucky Luciano all met at a seafood restaurant at 3 p.m. on April 15th of 1931. Luciano excuses himself from the card game while that they're playing to visit the bathroom. This is the signal for the hitmen. The bangs could be heard from around the block apparently, as Joe was hit from behind four times in the back and one in the head. And it's born, the infamous Ace of Spades shot. It added to the cult status of this hit, but many expect that the Ace of Spades card was placed between Mysterious fingers after the hit by a photographer just for the shock factor of the press. Number seven. Menendez brothers. We're all fans of something, whether it's art, music, or sports, and for the Menendez brothers, they would be so excited to see that they happen to be in the photo card. But the most disturbing part of this photo is the fact that these two killed their parents before the photo was even taken. They went on a six month spending binge with their money. The case was so shocking to the media, including how after the deaths occur, the brothers went to watch James Bond's License to Kill and tried to use it as an alibi. How a week prior, their mother confided to her therapist that she was worried that her sons were psychopaths, and how one brother brought an entire chicken wing restaurant with the parents money after they had passed away. Their father was an executive in the entertainment industry and both went into private schools and the older brother Lyle was briefly enrolled in Princeton. After two deadlocked juries, LA prosecutors retired the brothers in a courtroom that did not allow cameras and the new jury found them guilty on two counts of the first degree. They were sentenced by the judge to life in prison. Number 6. Aquino Filipino people have been known to fight resistance against imperialism and oppressors as that seems to be all of our history to be composed of and that is the truth. And for Ninoy Aquino, he was opposing threat as the political activist against the long dictatorship and assailant of the martial law, Fernandez Marcos. He tried to run for president in 1973, but then Marcos declared martial law in 1972, preventing him to run. Benigno Aquino, or as we know his, by his nickname, Ninoy Aquino, was imprisoned by the Marcos regime for speaking out against him where he was locked in prison and tormented for seven years. It wasn't until he suffered a heart attack did Marcos' wife Emilda allow him to go to the United States to get treatment, only under the condition that he does not come back home to the Philippines. But Aquino knew that his love for the people and the Philippines was more important as there were many people wrongfully prosecuted or just be found dead on the street for protesting against Marcos. He did plan to go back and before he arrived to the Philippines he warned reporters, hey, this might be the last time you ever actually speak to me, and he was right. In this photo was the photo before he left the plane out towards the Philippines airport. He kept saying he had a bulletproof vest on but the assailant shot him in the head. There were countless reporters that day that knew something was going on only for them to be all shocked to see his body on the ground. There's even footage of his assassination on Online, and his death sparked an outrage throughout all of the Philippines asking for justice. But of course, the United States always has to get involved in something, and they were able to get the Marcos family out of persecution from the very people he tormented and controlled for years. Number 5, Tyler Hadley. Everyone likes a good party selfie, including Tyler Hadley, who we can see here drinking a party cup with some friends. But what they don't know is that if they walked into the master bedroom was the killed bodies of his parents that he ended moments before the party. Tyler allegedly decided how he wanted to commit the crime a few weeks prior to committing them. He often told a friend exactly 
exactly what he was planning to do at the time, noting that having a big party after a parasite had never been done before. Shortly after noon, Tyler wrote on his Facebook wall, party at my crib tonight, maybe. Around 60 people attended the party at that night and several had alleged to have noticed the smell of dead bodies. Gross. During the party, Tyler apparently told several people about what he had done. Tyler went on a short walk with a friend and Michael Mandel and confessed the crime. After returning to the party, Mandel discovered the bodies of Blake and Mary Jo in the master bedroom. Mandel did not leave the party immediately, in fact he had continued to spend hours with Tyler and even took a selfie with him, which is what we see. Four hours later, Mendel left the party and called the local crime hotline to report the incident, which is pretty smart on his end because if he did something then you know Tyler would have done something to him. News of the crime was then spread by word of mouth and Haley was arrested early in the next morning. Number 4. Tank Man When it comes to revolution, all it takes is one person. After all, a single grain of rice can tip the scale. The Tank Man photograph was taken on the morning of the 5th of June, 1989, the day after the Chinese government had violently suppressed protests in Tiananmen Square. An estimated 10,000 civilians were killed in the massacre following weeks of a student-led demonstration in Beijing and beyond against the communist regimes and the suppression of basic human rights and freedom of expression. The image captures a lone man standing in the middle of the Chang and Avenue just off the square facing down a column of four slowly advancing Type 59 tanks of the Chinese army in a defiant protest. The identity of the tank man still remains anonymous as people don't know what happened to him after, but he has been noted as a notable figure in the stance against militia harm to the people. Number 3. Jolie Kellen when it comes to love, if you know something is off, listen to your gut and be safe first. Unfortunately for Jolie, she only left one memory to a friend that something ever happened to her, they know who the cause was. In 2015, 18 year old Jolie Kalen was hiking with her ex boyfriend Lauren Bunner when he photographed her on a cliff before he pushed her off of it. The 20 year old killer nearly escaped justice by claiming he was on the autism spectrum in court. This is the exact photo before he pushed her off. Bunner later called the cops and said, I just want to turn myself in for the crime of my ex girlfriend that happened just a little while ago on Cheheha Mountain. Later that evening on August 30th, 2015, police found her body still wearing her backpack. Cops believe that he had lured Callahan, who still wanted to remain friends with her former boyfriend, there to kill her because she wouldn't take him back. The court heard him bragging to cellmates about killing the 18 year old, saying if he couldn't have her, no one else could. Number two, Omeg. If you're lucky, you may have had some cute outing photos with your family and friends when you were younger. In this particular photo, it seems like an ordinary day with a young girl and her dad. But unfortunately, it was actually moments before an explosion incident caused by the real IRA or the real Irish Republic Army, a provincial Irish Republican Army splinter group who opposed the IRA ceasefire and the Good Day Friday and the Good Friday Agreement signed earlier that year. The explosion killed 29 people and injured about 220 others. The red Vauxhall Calvier containing the bomb. I can't say. Can I say bomb? The red, Volkswagen, the red Vauxhall Calvier containing the explosion, this photograph was taken shortly before the explosion, and the camera was found afterwards in the rubble. The man and the child in the photo both survived, and the injured survivor, Marion Radford, described hearing an unearthly bang followed by eeriness, a darkness that had just come over the place, then screams as she saw bits of bodies, limbs on the ground while she searched for her 16-year-old son. Alan. She learned. She later discovered he had been killed yards away from her after the two became separated just minutes before the blast. And finally, number one, Andes. Personally, one of the most creepiest photo, and it actually made me feel pretty uncomfy with this one. Seems like a cool crew cut photo of just a bunch of dudes. When in reality, these are the survivors of an Air Force Flight 571 crash in the Andes. Pilot Fer Ferardas had flown across the Andes 29 times previously, and on this flight, he was training a co-pilot, Laguara, who was at the controls. As they flew through the Andes. Andes, clouds obscured the mountains, and the controller in Santiago, unaware the flight was still over the Andes, authorized him to descend to 11,500 feet. The rugby players on board joked about the turbulence at first until some passengers saw that the aircraft was very close to the mountain. That was probably the moment when the pilots saw the Black Ridge rising dead ahead. After the crash, of the 45 people on the aircraft, three passengers and two crew members of the tail section were killed when it broke apart. The survivors had little food, only eight chocolate bars, a tin of mussels, three small jars of jam, a tin of almonds, a few dates, candies, dried plums, and several bottles of wine. Eventually, their friends made an agreement that if they ever died, they would offer themselves for them to eat, and so they did. The group survived by collectively deciding to eat flesh from the bodies of their dead comrades, and in the photo you can see on the right, a spine. At the end, eight people were rescued and they lived. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Mad Bomber. This is a photo that was taken of someone known as the Mad Bomber. His real name is George Metzky, and he was the man who terrorized New York City for 16 years while he planted explosives in public places like an absolute psychopath. I guess he was apparently angry about a workplace injury he had suffered in the years prior to his terrible crimes. And so, of course, the normal reasonable jump to make would be 
Um, not that at all. While no one should have ever had to suffer because of these crimes, the good news is that while he planted 33 bombs and set off 22 of them, miraculously only 15 people ended up injured in the end. This photo of him behind bars is extremely eerie thanks to his creepy smile and haunting eyes. I might be the only one who feels it, but it just seems like something's off. You know? In our number nine spot today, we have the figures of the fire. This photo is both extremely unsettling and super captivating as it shows a scene after the great fire at Madame Tussauds in 1925. Of course, this wax museum is famous for the extremely lifelike wax figures that are created and find their home there, so you can only imagine the aftermath of the fire. These lifelike figures with missing heads and appendages, burnt skin and hair, and just clothing in disarray. Seeing this photo for the first time without knowing the story behind it was definitely a bit of a confusing and terrifying experience. The heads on the ground really freaked me out for a full five seconds. As scary as it is, I'm glad to hear it's not real and just some creative casualties rather than what this photo appears to be at first. In our number eight spot today, we have the Spectre. This is a photo that was taken in England in 1963, and it became known as the specter of the newbie church. That is, of course, because of the ghostly figure that can be seen in the photo. I personally am always a little suspicious of ghost photos. Some are certainly more convincing than others, but Photoshop in 1963 wasn't exactly as accessible and easy as it is now. This photo is said to have been taken by Reverend K.F. Lord inside of the newbie church, which is located in North Yorkshire, England. Of course, I mean, like many of us are going to do, people were really skeptical of this apparition and just believed it was a well done case of double exposure, which to be fair, is entirely possible. The reverend continued to swear up and down however that the photo was not doctored, so at this point, there's no proof to prove either side and it's just a game of he said she said. So what do you guys think? Apparition caught slipping or is the reverend just making it up? Next is a series of photos recovered before they could be lost. Holes in a window. Former LAPD reserve officer turned photographer Merrick Morton was faffing around in the LA Police Department when he comes across a stash of LAPD crime photos ranging in the dates of 1920s all the way to the 1970s. These were cellulose nitrate based film and the negatives were so decomposed they're deemed fire hazard. But Merrick saw enough of the few stills to know that they'd be an absolute effing gold mine. Working with Phototech and Photo Digitation Service and the US National Film Archive, the photos were given a new life. This collection is NSFW and there are hundreds. Now spruced up, the macabre photos are are mostly crimes and many of them violent and depicting the bodies or surviving victims injuries. Obviously the ones you're seeing on screen as I'm talking are tamer, such as my choice, the one you're seeing now, holes in the car window. Something about it gives me a deep sense of discomfort, thus the choice. The collection contains recognizable crimes and faces too, an unusual photo of Malaya Nurmi dressed as Vampira, pictures of comedian Lenny Bruce's OD in March of 1966, and images of the Manson family arriving at their arrangement in 1970. Every photo is scary and every single has a disturbing backstory. Some captions are provided by author James Elroy in his book LAPD 53. You can win, but sometimes you still lose in the end. It's the devastated Disney's. Meet Howard Ashman and Alan Menken. There are some everyday photos of these two in their prime. Who were they? In case you couldn't tell by all the Disney crap in the background of said photos, they played somewhat of a big role. You know, writing the lyrics and music for Oliver and Company, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and Beauty and the Beast as well as a few others. Also not to mention creating the Little Shop of Horrors, which got them hired by Disney in the first place. And in this photo you see now, they had just won the Oscars for The Little Mermaid. Hooray! But why does Ashman look so unhappy? This was his life's accomplishments. It's because that night Ashman told Menken they needed to have a serious talk when they got back to New York. And when they get back a few days later, Ashman admits that he has HIV that's quickly progressed and he's going to die soon and fast. They had been songwriting partners for over a decade and were in the middle of working on Beauty and the Beast and despite the illness, Ashman completed the lyrical work and the initial work on Aladdin. On the morning of March 14, 1991, he does die from heart failure caused by his condition. At the time of his death, he only weighed 80 pounds, he'd lost his sight and could barely speak, and a voice that spoke so eloquently through song was lost forever. Before he passed, however, Disney production scrambled to finish the film so he could see a screening of it. The film earned Ashman and Menken three 1991 Academy Award nominations for Best Song and the title song winning the award. Perhaps most amazingly, Beauty and the Beast was the first animated film ever nominated for an Academy Award for Best Motion Picture. So it looks like a photo of two men achieving their wildest dreams, but it's a record of their last normal moment together. Oh look, it's the D-Bags day off. Camp 
staff. Check out this jolly go lucky group. They got the day off of work because the weather was nice for the first time in a long time. During the war time that must have been awesome, especially being young. Finally shirk responsibility, maybe go get a pint, have a picnic, hang out with each other, maybe get a little frisky, lavishing in the sun. I'm done looking at them, in fact I'm sick by having to look at them. When that group of people is going to have lighted and silly summer fun on a day off, they're going back to their jobs at the camps of World War II. To do exactly what you're thinking they would be doing for work when I say they work at the camps of World War II. And they enjoyed it. This wasn't one of those mandatory war jobs or excuses you can make up for following orders. These young adults who may as well be the grandmothers, grandfathers, or great grandma or pa of people even watching chose to do this job and actively enjoyed it. So this is a good reminder it's not that far in the past and these people most likely took lives shortly before or after this photo was taken. Uh, did Halloween come early or is it just Sylvester Claus? Yeah, so um, I chose this photo out of trust me like thousands of equally creepy ones because I feel it truly captures the what the bleep factor this holiday has. And they do it every 31st of December to 13th of January. The Sylvester Claus and of Ernotch and the surrounding area Appenzell custom that is famous throughout Switzerland. The custom derives its charm from the unique blending of contrasts such as nature and art, mystery and tradition, harmony and anarchy. The Sylvester Claus that ushered the old year out and ring in the new. There are three types of these clauses. The beautiful, the ugly, and the pretty ugly. Common to all the clauses are bells in various shapes and sizes that they wear on their bodies. Their rituals begin in the early morning each day. The various shupal meet at the village square before each group goes its own way. A group will pull up in front of your house, then hop around and jump up and down to make the bells ring, and then they start yodeling at you. You listen to the yodel, they say happy new year, give you some cash, some liquor you have to drink from a straw, and then they just leave. Dark backstory gossip, however, in times of poverty and hunger, which afflicted the region frequently, Clausen was a way to earn a little extra money, and in the 1930s, what was known as Belchel Claus, aka the Beggar Claus, began to appear on the streets. Essentially homeless Santa Clauses, but Santa looked like that. As a result, the influx of beggars in the Claus Guide resulted in heavy restrictions, and in the 1950s, the custom had nearly died out. It's only thanks to the initiative of individuals in the 1970s that this got to come back and enjoys enormous popularity today. Somebody come get their creepy uncle. Cannot tell me this isn't the energy this photo gives. Creepy uncle. The woman is unidentified, but definitely a follower to be able to handle that guy's BO and greasy hands on her. It was taken of the Children of God leader, David Berg. This group started in 1968 in California after Berg claimed God himself had gifted him with prophecies. In reality, Berg started making extreme demands of his followers, give up their money, worldly possessions in exchange for limited outside access horrible cramped living conditions, brainwashing, and oh yeah, a would make this group famous for really bad reasons I can't and would rather not get into. Former members of COG have been outspoken about the childhood they suffered growing up in the communes. Actress Rose McGowan, the most famously outspoken, published her story of nine years in the group. Actors Joaquin and River Phoenix, also raised in the cult, had it harder than Rose, and that trauma plagued River especially. He was actually the original heartthrob of the 80s and 90s, a role, fun fact, DiCaprio only managed to take once River's substance addiction caused by his traumatic childhood unfortunately took his life. So more of an unfun fact, but the matter stands that River painted the way for DiCaprio and this psycho ruined a lot of people's lives. Have you ever seen a photo you can feel? Before you see the photo itself, you're going to learn about the man in it. So Joseph Goebbels, a national socialist politician and propagandist who held multiple high rank roles in the uh, Yahtzee party. As a party chief for Greater Berlin, 1926 to 45, Reich leader of propaganda, 1929 to 45. And in 1933, the push broom mustache twit appointed Joseph the Minister for Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. He was a devout and brittle through and through bigot, a tireless agitator, and the propaganda this man designed, wrote, and funded had shipped through dozens of countries and shaped the perspective of Jews in a way that can actually never be undone. It's this propaganda many people still cite when asked for factual basis or logical argument as what Jews had done oh so wrong. It's Joseph who orders the mass burning of literature, who sentenced thousands to death and who made up lies to ensure hatred, a hatred that still stands today. And I want you guys to see how he looked at them. So here is the photo, finally. This is a picture of Joseph Goebbels taken only seconds after he found out the photographer was Jewish. In this photo, you can feel it. And it's effing terrifying. And now, the last photo is from El Monte, 6 May. That's the date written on this photo from the LAPD collective. And it's the only other photo from said collection I chose to put on this list aside from the holes in the car 
window. As follows is the photo and James L. Roy's written description of it. This is a detective modeling a mask worn by Baxter Shorter's crew. Shorter was in a gaggle with Emmett Perkins, Jack Santos, and Barbara Graham. The three of them then killed an old woman named Mabel Monahan on 9 March 1953. Shorter was appalled by his gaggle's violence. He ratted the others out and Santo and Perkins kidnapped him in front of his pad on Bunker Hill, took him to the mountains, and killed him. Shorter had a sister that lived in El Monte and they were hunting through it for evidence. This mask was in her pad. James Elroy. If Mabel Monahan's former son-in-law, Tudor Scherer, hadn't been a Las Vegas gambler, the 60-year-old widow probably would have never been killed. Also, if she didn't stay friends with him after he divorced her daughter, that'd probably have helped. But she did, and people found that weird. So there had to be something at play, right? Maybe Scherer trusted her so much he stored his 100 grand floats there. Ex-cons Emmett Perkins, John True, and Jack Santos think that, and they plan to take it. Barbara Graham joins the group to be their key into the door. Mabel takes a while to open up, but Barbara persuades her with the story of a broken down car and pleas for the phone. Mabel was reluctant, but the young woman was alone, and the widow knew firsthand how scary it could be for a woman to be on her own at night, so she let her in. And in comes John True, Jack, Emmett, wearing rubber masks. We're gonna take a pause. Ladies and female presenters, our own sex does not guarantee our safety, and you can't predict anyone's intentions. Please trust your gut if it says don't open that door. Mabel is struck on the head, left gagged and bleeding in the hallway. The group ransacks her home for a safe that never exists and panic when there is none, so they just leave her there. Mabel is dead for two days in her home before she's found. The investigation into the slaying of the Burbank widow began and it was a long one, filled with drama. In the end, the four are charged with conspiracy to commit burglary, robbery, and M-word on June 3rd, 1953, in the death of Miss Mabel Monahan. First up is captured in a card. Alrighty, so you see this basketball card here. So centered, we've got Mark Jackson back in 89 playing a Knicks game. But over here in the far left background, we have familiar faces of Lyle and Eric Mendez. In 1990, the Mark Jackson NBA hoops card went into circulation. A year after the two Mendez brothers depicted in the background killed their parents for life insurance in August of 1989. The brothers claimed a massive payout that allowed them to live a luxurious lifestyle, spending money on expensive watches, clothes, and cars. Among the items that they bought were tickets to a basketball game at Madison Square Garden, where they would eventually be immortalized on an NBA card. To make it a little creepier, logistically, this moment captured would have been between when they killed their parents and when they were arrested. Speaking of sports, there's such a thing as the wrong time to cheer, which is our next photo. See, this is Mike Hawthorne and Ivor Webb celebrating with champagne after winning the 24-H Le Mans. Look at the revelry and the glory between these men. Those around them have a completely different vibe, however. We've got an arrangement of meme expressions going on here. Homeboy in the back holding the book is giving a hell of a judgmental side eye, and we have a signature auntie are you serious expression going on. See, while these men are ecstatically celebrating their win, what isn't captured in this photo was that the raceway was covered in ambulances and fire trucks. Hawthorne had driven an opponent off the track and the resulting accident killed 84 people, most of which were spectators. Videos of this event on YouTube are kinda insane to watch, not even because of the crash or the arrogance of the winners, but the announcer is so painfully cheery it's out of place, using an old timely projection system to shout, oh women and children are dying, whole families are wiped out, but most of the finishing cars were British, a fine achievement in this abhorrent tragedy. It feels like a fever dream. Mountain climb to heaven is next. Because if you climb Mount Everest, let's be realistic, all you're doing is making your inevitable trip to heaven a little shorter of a distance upwards, giving yourself and the creator a little shortcut, you know? Alright, so this photo has the same visual quality as some loosely scattered cat litter, but I'm sure you can make out that we've got these silly little tents here. Man, look how far tents have come. As well as these two dudes and what it looks like high socks. This is the 1924 British Mount Everest expedition. We've talked about a few Mount Everest climber groups and things that have happened to them in a few of our videos, so you may be familiar with this one from our channel. That or literally any Mount Everest movie. They tend to either pick one specific story to document or mismatch all of them together for one plot and then throw Jake Gyllenhaal up on a mountain. Anyways, this photo was taken of George Mallory and Sandy Irvin shortly after they made their ill-fated attempt to get to the summit. While Mallory's body is found literally decades later in 1999, 
behind, the body of Irvin never has been. In our number seven spot today, we have the Tsar Bomba. This is a photo that was taken on October 30th, 1961. It was quite the Halloween spooky fright that year, as this is said to be the largest and most powerful nuclear weapon ever created and tested. The hydrogen aerial bomb was developed in the Soviet Union by a group of nuclear physicists that were under the leadership of Igor Kurchatov. The bomb was dropped by parachute and was detonated autonomously. While this test was meant to be a secret, turned out to be less than well kept, as it was obviously a huge explosion that was detected by United States intelligence agencies. A secret US recon aircraft called Speed Light Alpha was there monitoring the explosion and it got so close that it had its anti-radiation paint absolutely scorched off. The photo clearly shows the bomb as it exploded and it is said that this bomb was 5,000 times stronger than the ones that were dropped on Japan during World War II. That's not to say that those ones weren't strong because they were absolutely devastating, it's just an example to show how large this one really was. In our number 6 spot today we have the Three Jacksons. On August 21st, 1934, three fearless acrobats known as the Three Jacksons, Charlie Smith, Jewel Waddick, and Jimmy Kerrigan all performed a routine on the edge of the Empire State Building which is when this photo was captured. It is said that these three toured as an acrobatic trio and this stunt the photo captured was done at 1,245 feet. According to officials from the Empire State Building, it is said that this was the first time the stunt was attempted and to this day it has never been done again. Which makes a lot of sense. Well, this photo is absolutely incredible and is such a testament not only to the trust that they shared, but also their abilities as acrobats. I don't know who in their right mind would try to recreate this. We already have one. I think we can just all be happy with that. In our number five spot today, we have the Gentleman of Rehi. This photo shows the Gentleman of Rehi, and that is not a gentleman and instead is the world's oldest surviving diving suit. It is an absolutely terrifying sight, but also an important pillar that allowed for this kind of technology to develop Developed to what it is today. The suit date back to the early 18th century, but it came to find its home at the Rehi Museum during the 1860s after it was donated. The suit was initially designed to allow people the ability to check the hull of ships without having to bring them into dry dock. The old gentleman is made mostly of leather with pitch thread used to stitch the seams. From here, the suit is sealed with more pitch, and then to create the waterproof coat, it is covered in a mixture of mutton tallow, tar, and pitch. Of course, under water pressure increase increases dramatically, and this is why there's also wooden framework in the hood in order to keep it from collapsing under the pressure. At the top of the hood, there is an opening for a wooden air pipe. The air will be pumped to the diver, then it can be released from the suit through a pipe on the backside. Of course, this means that the suit wasn't completely watertight, so divers could only go under for a short period and couldn't dive very deep because there was only so much pressure the suit could take, but still, the suit was far better than having no suit at all. In our number four spot today, we have ectoplasm. This photo is said to have been taken in 1910 and it shows a medium in the middle of a spiritual seance. I don't know about you, but a 1910 seance sounds like an absolutely terrifying time. This photo is said to be catching the moment that ectoplasm appears out of the mouth of the medium. When we're talking about the occult and the paranormal, ectoplasm is a viscous substance that exudes from a spiritual entity or sometimes the earthbound medium who is connected to or communicating with the spirit. It is said that this substance can take the shape of a face or a hand or a complete body and it's usually seen in a darkened room during a sort of seance. And this is the way that the paranormal can physically manifest themselves in our world. So basically, what I'm saying is that this is supposed to be the moment that an evil entity is making themselves known in our world. Thankfully, at the end of the contact with the spirit, the ectoplasm will usually disappear as it returns to the entity, so it hopefully didn't stay around long, but this photo sure is something. In our number three spot today, we have the isolator. There are tons of strange inventions from the past. We have entire lists and videos dedicated to the strange inventions, there's so many. And while this is one that can be added to the list of bizarre inventions, it can also be added to the list of creepy ones as well. This photo shows what was meant to be a sort of anti-distraction contraption from the 1920s. Listen. I can get easily distracted, so sometimes I need a little help. But this thing really takes it to a new level. It essentially makes it impossible for the person to look at anything other than what is directly in front of them, or, you know, 
breathe. It seems like a contraption that requires an oxygen tank hookup probably isn't going to be the best anti-distraction device. In fact, I think that's probably more distracting than anything. Honestly, I'm such a good procrastinator that even with this thing, I still wouldn't get my work done. Thankfully, this device didn't stick around or gain much popularity, and now it is just a terrifying relic of the past. In our number two spot today, we have the Great Manta. In 1933, a New York silk manufacturer named A.L. Kahn was on a nice little vacation in Florida when he honestly accidentally caught something remarkable. His anchor line, by mistake, caught onto a giant manta ray. After a struggle and several hours, Kahn was able to get this actually enormous fish ashore. This monster was somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000 pounds and was 20 feet and 5 inches in width. For reference, there are other giant manta rays, but they usually grow to be around 13 to 14 feet wide, not 20 and a half. This photo is showing a taxidermy version of the fish, which Khan used to bring around to exhibitions to show off his accidental cache. In an article from December 10th, 1933 of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch's Sunday Magazine, Khan is quoted as saying, fishing is a lot of fun when you catch the fish, and sometimes it's fun even when you don't, but when the fish catches you. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the advertisement. This is a photo that comes to us from the time of World War II, and it shows a very terrifying kind of ad. The sign reads, these men didn't take their Atabrine. And at first I had absolutely no idea what that was. Turns out that Atabrine was actually the first synthetic form of a drug which was used by the US military to fight malaria in the South Pacific during the war. It is estimated that as many as two thirds of the troops fell ill with malaria. The sign is said to have been posted outside of a military hospital in New Guinea and was meant to serve as a warning for those who didn't take the medicine, warning that the skulls on top would be the fate that awaited them. Perhaps a little dark, but creative and likely effective nonetheless. At the very least, the ad is definitely quite clear. Number 10, the cube. All right, Transformers fans, let's do this. I feel like we're hearing more about these things like UFOs or UAPs, whatever you want to call them now. I feel like we're hearing about them now more than ever. So why not kick this weird list off with something off world? We have to include some alien cover ups, right? It's me, it's Taylor, why not? I figured that I'd find one that's also not too well known. We haven't seen this one, you know, on YouTube all the time. Not too long ago, this spinning cube looking craft or drone or something, it was spotted over Missouri, just lurking in the same spot, just hovering. And then it would zoom off. Folks could see it with their naked eye on the ground. It was also pretty obvious. It was eye grabbing, it was shiny in the sky. Only a couple hours later, it was seen again, but this time it was 700 miles away. This time it was 44 year old Matthew Jandeka. He was minding his own business, hanging out on the porch, just doing his, you know, Sunday, Sunday stuff. When this cube, again, this this floaty cube caught his attention. It was a sunny day, the light reflecting off the cube caught his eye, but then a day later, another guy, 30 year old Justin Johnson, he saw the same thing, but this time he saw it while he was driving home, which is also pretty distracting. The light and the reflections also caught his eye. He says, at first I thought maybe it was a balloon, but the movements were too odd. In a world full of deep fakes, I mean, do we believe this account? Is this real? Lately everyone's talking about how these UFOs are spheres, so maybe this video is that of a sphere. Not a cube. That's cool. I love teaching geometric shapes via alien aircraft. I'm like, this is a triangle. We saw this one in the Navy. Then we saw this cube in the sky. Number nine, Amityville photo. Okay, we'll go less UFOs, more ghosts. One M. Night Shyamalan theme to the other. Here we go. This photo was taken inside the actual Amityville house back in 1976. It's a young man, it appears, with glowing white eyes. How comforting is that? Pretty, pretty hard to miss there. He's got the glowing... Yeah, it looks very Sin City of him, just to stare with those white eyes. Now, at first, I thought this was from a horror movie, right? All those Amityville knockoffs. It looks obviously fake or set up in some way, until you start to read about the details here. See, this photo, it was taken with automatic cameras equipped with infrared, not an actual person. So, this young lad here probably wasn't expecting a selfie. Why I wasn't smiling or throwing up a peace sign. Makes sense now. Photographer Gene Campbell set up the photo and took it back in 1976. Now, at the time, Gene was working with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren on the actual case. Huh. I'm scared now. This photo was revealed three years after it was taken on the Merv Griffin show, and many believe this is the ghost of John DeFeo, one of the victims in 1974. Now, you can't really do this anymore, right? You can't whip out photos from a otherwise crime scene and be like, okay gang, what do we think, spirit or not a spirit? 
vote yes, no. Obviously there was backlash after this for obvious reasons, but it took three years for that photo to reach the public eye, and now everybody believes in ghosts, or they do a little more than they did before that show. This was long before The Conjuring movie as well, obviously, so this was quite random to see on TV. Do you believe in ghosts? What's the ratio here? Comment down below. I'm not a believer, I'm not gonna lie. I've tried numerous times. I got the Ouija board, did the whole thing. Felt nothing, man. Like an 18 year old on Christmas. I'm like, is that it? Is it done? Do I have to feel anything anymore? Number eight, Alfred Hitchcock and the MGM Lion. All right, you're gonna hear me roar after this one. This photo was from 1958. You've seen this at some point, right? Hopefully, or else, you know, we'll send over a VHS, we'll help you out. It was taken by Clarence Sinclair Bull. Now the photo appears to be, well, no, it doesn't appear to be at all. It's Alfred Hitchcock serving tea to a lion. Yeah, the famous MGM lion. His name's Leo, that's him, there he goes, he's getting tea. He loves suspense and tea, who would have thought? And company, it appears. North by Northwest was the only film that Hitchcock did with MGM. So there's a rumor now that he directed the lion's roar for the MGM intro, which is fun. But you're also like, okay, that's a real animal, that's kinda, that's sad. And also, that's probably nonsense. There have been seven MGM lions in total. Yeah, not just one. But Leo was known to be the most friendly. I wanna hear about the other six. I'm like, what happened there? He's still in the logo today. Today, but again, back in the 1950s, it's hard to say what it was really like on set. I mean, it's still a lion being held down for a photo, so probably wasn't a friendly vibe for that fella. Our next photo is of an undeserving celebrity. Why? Because the reason he's a celebrity is so extremely twisted that it blows me away. And I don't mean an undeserving in a Kim Kardashian made a family of talentless people famous through adult video kind of way. I mean in a seriously sick, twisted, criminal, undeserving way. I'll only be calling this man IS, as I do not believe any more infamy should be granted. The photo you see was from a Japanese magazine after he was released from prison due to insanity. IS killed Dutch-born Renee Harveld and the two were studying in Saborn, Paris. He chose to do this because of her health and her beauty characteristics that he felt he lacked. IS considered himself weak, ugly, and small and claimed he wanted to absorb her energy through, well, he had her body for three days. I'll simply let you piece together what I mean when I say that he had a considerable amount of this body missing and a very interesting fridge contents. But like I said, he was released. So how can you kill someone whilst on a student visa, desecrate remains, and then also do some pretty horrific acts posthumously? He is from a very wealthy Japanese family and they somehow managed to get him released. Also, they paid the victim's parents a huge sum of money for the loss. That's the world we live in. After his release, he was frequently on talk shows, reviewed restaurants for magazines, and appeared in horror films. He even wrote a book on the murder of Renee. This next photo shows us you never know what could be just a reach away. This photo looks relatively normal. Now obviously it's not gonna be, it's on this list and the fact that it's titled about reaching out to something, well. Sarah Funk, who you see here on the waterline, is a YouTube vlogger who's on a trip to Cyprus's Red Lake. And you can see her literally like two feet away from a suitcase lodged in the waterbed. It's two years after this photo is taken in 2019 that the drifting suitcase is retrieved and opened to reveal the corpse of a girl. She is one of seven known victims of serial killer Nikos Mexata, whose signature was doing body dumps in suitcases. It's believed the reason this case was retrieved in the first place was due to previous sightings of it in the water once other victims of Nikos had started to be found and identified at the same time period. Sarah Funk has since commented on what it's like to know that she was so close to a body without being aware. I thought it was a log at the time, but in retrospect, I realized it wasn't. This is a completely fair explanation. As you can see from that picture, the case was incredibly dirty and hard to identify even as a briefcase. This man is the first recorded serial killer on the island of Cyprus and is currently serving seven life sentences in central prison. Our next photo is recreating time, pun is intended. The photo you see on screen is very peculiar, but not the most outlandish. It's a man standing shirtless behind the fence in a summer afternoon, looking like something out of an old country family album of sorts. His name is Fikrek Alik, and he was photographed in this exact spot for a Time magazine cover back in 1992. You are quite literally looking twice with these images. Emaciated, it's almost hard to recognize him. Fikrek can be seen holding his t-shirt in one hand and reaching with his other through the barbed wire to take someone's hand. This is during the Bosnian War from 1992 to 95, and Fikrek was one of many prisoners held in camps at the time. This recreation of the Time magazine cover was taken in the mid 2000s and the building behind him now is a community center without any plaques or memorials of the victims of the notorious prisoner camps in Bosnia. This region is now under the rule of the same faction that was responsible for the camp so they engage in a lot of historical denials and concealing. Fikret's story remains one of incredible perseverance especially as he and other victims still go before the UN today in battle to have reparations and acknowledgement. This vintage photo isn't so vintage but it's old enough so I'm counting it. It's bad Santa. 
Santa. This early 2000s family Christmas photo reps a normal looking scene. White picket fence family, the itchy velvet Christmas dresses, the big sparkly tree, and the serial killer Santa. That there is Bruce MacArthur. In the warm seasons he is a landscaper, but working in the Agincourt Mall as Santa during the holidays. Between 2010 and 2017 he terrorized the gay village district of Toronto, Ontario. Luring men in through dating apps, he killed and disposed of eight individuals in the planter boxes of properties he managed. For a long time in the community, people had known someone was taking gay men off the street, but the Toronto police were resistant in believing something was suspicious. I remember myself seeing posts on Reddit and Twitter mere months after the first of the disappearances, frustrated with the lack of police action and urging the community members to stay alert. It takes multiple victims and community engagement for police to start an investigation, and it's thankfully in the nick of time. They'd been watching Bruce for a while before his arrest when they saw a young man enter his place. After about a half hour of nothing, they decide to make the risk to move in for an arrest. When they entered the unit, the young man was tied up and unconscious, and they caught Bruce in the act. No way to plead guilty, my guy. He's found guilty of eight counts of first degree murder. Our next vintage photo is one that speaks to a still in modern times, a determined mother. This photo was taken on Mother's Day. The woman in it is Margie, a 23 year old, and she's holding her infant son while attempting to hitchhike. As you can see, it was printed in a newspaper column and has a subject line describing Margie's struggle with her husband Mike to find an apartment. I imagine that struggle alongside the fact that she is hitchhiking likely correlates with financial difficulties. Unfortunately, Margie's luck never got better. This is very likely the last photo of Margie alive. Less than four months later, she was killed by her husband Mike during a fight. In the time between this photo and her demise, their son Brandon had been taken away and put into foster care, where he was later adopted by his foster parents after Margie's sudden death. Little information exists on the photo other than this and on what Brandon's life became. This is still recent enough history that some may recognize the story, the manifesto man. This photo seems so simple. A man appears to be in a wetsuit, he has multiple police badges displayed, and he sits in a stoic manner. This is no cop. In fact, this photo was taken after his arrest in July of 2011 for killing 77 people and injuring 250. Anders Behring had a manifesto for killing political enemies as a far right extremist, first killing eight people outside the tower block housing of the office of the prime minister. The method used caused distraction, enough for Anders slipping away in a police disguise to pull part two of his plan, which is hop in the ocean and swim to political youth swing summer camp just starting the season. He chose the summer camp for the politicians who came to visit the camp, which was for members of political youth adult clubs and organizations for co-ops, school courses, or just special interest in politics. Once on the island, well, he opened fire. Many who were afraid and unsure of where the danger was coming from went towards Anders for safety due to his police costume and received the opposite. His verbalized intent that day was to kill everyone he could, and thankfully he did not succeed. But some swam away and were rescued by people staying at campgrounds across the water who brought out boats to pull everyone out. Others hid in various places on the island. Netflix released the film 22nd of July about this event in Oslo, and the movies White Rage and Brave Hearts also tell the story. Ultimately, this event only took place due to Anders' racist ideology, believing Norwegian politicians were lenient on immigrants. Let's talk about the most disastrous hostage crisis our world might have ever seen, the Gladbeck hostage bus. The 1988 crisis in Gladbeck, Germany was the kind of disaster you don't see often. In this photo, you'll see a robber left and a hostage right taken on the last day of the situation. Day one, two dudes rob a bank and take some hostages. They demand a getaway car and took two hostages and then stopped for one of the robber's sisters casually on the way as reporters follow. Day two, the same robbers hijack a bus with 32 passengers. Whilst holding out in the bus, they allow reporters some entry to interview them. One robber even came outside the bus for an interview like an MTV crib situation but with hostages. The robbers state that their stance is that they don't care what happens because they'd simply take their own lives anyway if it all went wrong. Obviously this is a sign for police to maybe, I don't know, handle with a lot of caution. And like tossing stones at glass houses, caution was non-existent. When the robbers take off in the bus, once again followed by police and reporters just doing nothing, the robber's sister is arrested by police at the first gas station they stop at. Her arrest causes the robbers to lash out and kill a hostage, so the police release her and go back to doing nothing. After this, the road trip crosses jurisdictions into Netherlands. The Dutch police are now involved, and they demand the release of any young hostages on board with the promise of a BMW in return. The robbers took two hostages with them in the BMW and drove back to Germany. Later on, they were surrounded by a lot of media reporters who took a lot of pictures of the scene, which can be found in Google. That is where our photo of the hostage and the robber was taken. Finally, the German police, after days of this, make a move that isn't just following the robber's
was like a lost puppy. They rammed the hostage car, causing a crash. One of the hostages flees off the highway as police and robbers engage their firearms. The woman in our photo, Silky Bischoff, is sadly caught in the crossfire. The driving robber said later in an interview that the bullets came from a policeman, but the German police denies that and says that the bullets came from the robbers and hit the hostage. No matter what, the one thing I can say about this whole story is what the f was anyone trying to accomplish here? Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a stratovolcano located in Skamania County, Washington. This volcano is best known for its huge and disastrous eruption on May 18, 1980. This photograph comes from photographer Robert Landsberg, who of course was in the area at the time of the eruption. Before the eruption, he had visited the area in order to photograph and document all of the changes that were happening. On May 18th, he was within a few miles of the volcano when it erupted. Since he unfortunately was located so close to the explosion, he knew he would be unable to escape this disaster, so instead of focusing on the impossible, he focused on taking as many pictures as possible. Robert was obviously incredibly brave and dedicated, but also very smart. After snapping as many photos as he could, including this one, he then secured his camera in his backpack and covered his backpack with his body. He knew he was unlikely to survive but wanted to make sure that these photos did. His body was found 17 days later with his backpack still underneath him. His film was of course, um, his film was of course developed and has provided geologists with some really valuable insights with his close documentation of the eruption. In our number 9 spot today we have The Core. This photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew, and while this looks like a relatively normal, non-threatening photo, what he has in his hand is truly devastating. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man Atomic Bomb. This means that Harold is holding the nuclear core of the atomic bomb that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast of course took many lives, but so did the long term effects of the bomb, like radiation illness and that sort of thing. It's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems just so perfectly normal when he literally has a life changing, world ending device in the palm of his hand. Also, I don't think I could ever hold something like that. Not only would I just like not want to, but I would just be so afraid that something was gonna go wrong. In our number 8 spot today we have the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the clearly very excited Challenger crew as they walked down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. The crew even included 37 year old Krista McAuliffe who was a high school social studies teacher. She had won a spot on this mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space program and she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first non-military person in space. On January 28, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fatal just 73 seconds after liftoff. Two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures of the morning and on live television the world watched as the spacecraft broke apart and plunged into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everyone on board. It is an absolutely tragic event made even more chilling by this final photo. Number 7. Gloria Steinem. Oh here we go, a scandalous one. Back in 1963 the Playboy Club in New York City was booming. It was one of Hugh Hefner's greatest accomplishments at the time. This club was the talk of the town, that is until Gloria Steinem came in and started reporting some stuff. Gloria was a feminist writer, she's an icon, she created Miss Magazine back in 1972, but her career began much earlier around the 60s. See she got a job as one of these playboy bunnies, you know. Must be a comfortable getup. And she worked at the club undercover, secretly taking note on how this key holders only <sighs> establishment was operating, right? Cool, what's going on in here? What's the big scoop here? The staff were these young women, these beautiful young women, these bunnies. They had to wear the black bodysuits, the puffy white tails, the whole getup. And at age 28, Gloria worked undercover there for three weeks straight. And the piece she released after, appropriately titled A Bunny's Tale, Great title, by the way. She nailed that one. It got so much attention that it kickstarted her freelance career and also made her a feminist icon. This photo of Gloria undercover shows you the comfortable work outfits she had to endure just to get the story out. Yeah, doesn't look like she had her non slips on there. That's, that's a write up in my books. In a collection of her writings, Gloria reflects on the undercover piece, saying that it now has outlived all of the Playboy clubs, both here and abroad. That was before Hefner passed away in 2017, so I will add that you also outlived. Him as well. Good, he wasn't a very nice lad. Let's move on. Number six, North Sentinel Island. 
All right, we got some people, some aliens, some ghosts. What else do we need, Taylor? How about some weird islands? Sure. North Sentinel Island. We gotta head over to India for this one. This island is the home of the Sentinelese tribe. You've probably heard about this at some point. One of the most forbidden islands in the world, but why? Located in the Bay of Bengal, North Sentinel Island is about 1,200 kilometers away from India. And while most islands are shrinking, this one actually grew back in 2014. Yeah, the universe is like, more. Yeah, you need more of this, sure. The island lifted up a couple of meters during an earthquake, so the west and south sides, they gained an extra kilometer. Nice. DLC unlocked. The inhabitants on this island are among the few uncontacted tribes left in the world. They have apparently been there for 50,000 years, and there's no sign of agriculture or even fire. Yet somehow this tribe has thrived for ages. Now, if we try and get close, they will try and drive anybody away. More than fair. Like, we have enough room. We're good. Let's just leave. In fact, back in 2006, two fishermen sadly lost their lives because they got too close to the island without knowing who was on it or what the island was. Yeah, you can't just approach random islands. You gotta do some homework. That's why I'm here. Number five, Lascaux Cave. If you didn't visit this cave back in 1963 or sooner, well, you lost your chance because, well, humans ruin everything. Now we can't even see ancient art anymore because, well, it's too many of us. The Lascaux Cave system is now a World Heritage Site in France, but once it was a booming tourist attraction. These cave paintings, see, they're 17,300 years old. They're quite ancient. We can't really touch them. You can't have someone write Steve was here on it. Can't do that. Paintings that depict cattle, bison, stags, you name it. They're beautiful. They're complex. And of course, like I said, they're extremely old. So old, in fact, that the cave was closed to the public forever in 1963 after it declared human presence wasn't healthy for the the art. Yeah, our dirty coffee breath would eventually cause this art to fade away. So we had to hold our breath. We gotta leave. We gotta close it off. There we go. Plus, I'm sure somebody would have snuck in with a Sharpie by now and ruined it. You know what I mean? Or like graffiti. It would have been gone by now. You know it. 7,000 year old paintings. Yeah, protect these for another 17,000 years, please. Number four, Surtsey Island. Another fun island. Another weird story. Here we go. When it comes to new things in life, it's pretty rare that we get a new island, right? Especially on our planet when we're losing things and melting. How lucky are we? Sure. We're even luckier that Disney didn't build a resort here first because now scientists, now they get a chance to study what an island looks like without human interaction. That's a fun little project to focus on in the future. That's cool. It's pretty cool. It's weird and scary, but it's cool, I guess. Yeah, I'm kind of nervous. I don't know. Surtsey Island in Iceland, as of right now, it's only open to a few scientists and geologists. Everybody else? Beat it, go find your own island, get out of here. It was born from a volcanic eruption back in 1963 and scientists, they have one rule on this island, don't talk about Fight Club. And the second rule is no seeds. Yeah, no life, no chance at life at all. Choose something else, anything else, please. One guy accidentally pooped out a tomato seed and he almost ruined the whole operation. The guy almost ruined this entire plan. What a stressful job, it's so eerie to see the oldest human history and then immediately after see a new island where humans are forbidden. It's like, we're not allowed to go and be places anymore. I'm kind of uh, not, that's not great. What are we doing here? I'm just breathing on things, I can't take a sh this island? Number three, Spaceman. Look, we've all been photobombed before. It's a blessing in disguise. You look back at prom photos, some dude's trying to do a moonwalk in between, his face is like melting this way. It's great, you're like, ah, classic Jeff. It's the best. But when Jim Templeton took a photo of his daughter in a otherwise empty marsh long before Photoshop existed, and yet somehow there appears to be an astronaut in the background, well, that's not very fun, is it? That's a little bit concerning. Jim assures us that nobody was around when this photo was taken, which I of course believe, because why would you put your kid in a photo with whatever that is? That's, no, no thank you, it's not a weird, we're not gonna go and talk to that guy. Also, the fact that this man looks like he's from space, that ought to do it, that makes him more weird and believable. What are we looking at right now? I have no idea. Kodak even got involved in the story, like, Kodak. Not Kodak Black, like the company, they got involved. They confirmed this photo was not tampered with. Yeah, and that's Kodak, right? They don't lie about anything. Spider-Man Lee, Kodak's like, nah, it's Andrew Garfield. Don't listen to that. So authentic, can confirm. Number two, nursing home spirit. This photo was taken from a nursing home resident the same night that another resident had passed away, which is an odd thing to do, just set up a camera thing right after. You're like, yeah, just in case, you know, maybe we'll catch one. Well, they did. This was back in 2015, and that night they heard a door open and close, but there were no visitors allowed at the time. So, you know, some, some Kodak was coming into the picture at this point. So now there's a great amount of people who think that this image is one of two things. It's either the spirit of the resident that passed away, or it's the Grim Reaper. Yeah, the door opening and closing, People think that was the Grim Reaper coming in and then leaving, which is so scary. How long was he in there? Was it like 46 seconds, four minutes? How long does this guy operate? Is he quick? Is it like busting tables? Is he just like, all right, 
Let's do this. Is he like Santa Claus? I feel like he's like Santa Claus. A few comments were also saying that it's comforting, this photo, to know that in the end you aren't alone, and that you have someone assisting you to the um, afterlife. No, I'm good. I'd rather die alone than have uh, whatever that is break into my home and closing open doors. I'm good. And finally, number one, the Battle of Los Angeles, or lack thereof. We'll see, I don't know, this is a weird one. Of course, we have to end on one of the most unspeakable battles, photos, whatever you wanna call it, of all time. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great Los Los Angeles air raid happened during World War II, right at the end of February 1942. Now this event, first of all, took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack, so I'll admit, everyone's a little on edge. We're a little stressed out, we've got some hands hovering over some buttons, we're a little nervous. Sure, something like 25 enemy aircraft was apparently spotted flying over Los Angeles in the late hours of February 24th, so air raids then went off, blackouts were put in effect, this was not a drill, right? Or was it? What was this? This thing was getting lit up in the sky. Around 1,400 shells were blasted off and two people had a heart attack. That's how loud it was. In total, five people ended up dying from this retaliation and apparently it was a false alarm. Although many now believe that it was UFOs or aliens, and that's why we were launching stuff at it. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. People have heart attacks. He's like, oops, I was nervous, my bad, slipped. A little quick reaction there. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the burst of joy. You might be looking at this photo wondering how this extremely joyous photo could hold any dark secrets. Well, this photo won a Pulitzer Prize, and for a very good reason. The photo was captured by Slava Vedder on March 17th, 1973 at the Travis Air Force Base in California. The photo shows United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Robert L. Sturm and his family. This was taken as he was being reunited with his family after five years of being held as a prisoner of war in North Vietnam. On October 27, 1967, he was leading a flight of F-105s when he was shot down over Hanoi and held captive until March 14, 1973. I can't imagine what this must have been like for his family because there was a chance that he could have not come home at all. The girl with her arms wide open is his daughter, but the looks on all of their faces truly captures the pure joy that they are all feeling. In our number nine spot today, we have the reflecting pool. This is one of the creepiest or chilling images ever taken. It depicts a young girl in a graveyard who is looking down at her reflection in a pond. Okay, maybe a little eerie, but not exactly chilling. What really makes this photo what it is, however, is that there are seemingly two reflections looking back up at the little girl. No one knows who the girl is, where she is, or when this photo was taken, but it is estimated to have come from somewhere around the early 1900s. The photo was analyzed, and it has been said that it is unaltered or edited. Who knows how this photo was possible? Maybe there was some sort of invisible entity standing beside her that we could only see in the reflection, like a reverse vampire or something. In our number eight spot today, we have the neighborhood nuclear test. This photo shows a mother and her young son looking out the window and witnessing a nuclear test test explosion from the comfort of their own home in 1953. Like what? Imagine seeing that from your window now in 2023. People would be going wild. And of course, any kind of nuclear test should be done as far away from where people live as possible. I know it's not like the test was being done in their front yard or anything, but I still certainly wouldn't be comfortable with them testing a nuclear device anywhere near the place I live. This photo was of course taken before the effects of nuclear radiation from these kinds of explosions were publicly understood. Actually, people have suggested that the public knowledge knowledge of these kinds of side effects were suppressed during this time in order to avoid controversy about them testing these kinds of weapons in your neighborhood. Well, that would of course be something insane to witness firsthand. Thankfully, the now widely known health risks associated with this sort of thing has caused this to not be a common occurrence anymore. In our number seven spot today, we have the plague. This photo comes from the 19th century, from the third plague pandemic. This was the first time that the plague had spread to all five continents. While we now know something about what that might have been like, what we haven't had to endure are the doctors that dressed like this. This is a photo of the outfits and masks that plague doctors wore when they would come to your house to treat or diagnose you. The long beak-like noses of the masks are very creepy, but they were used to hold herbs and other nicely scented things because they believed that it would help ward off the bad air, which at the time is what they thought was causing the sickness. A pandemic certainly is bad enough. Thankfully, our doctors and nurses are just 
sticking to scrubs. In our number six spot today, we have the elephant's foot. This photo looks like it's just a big lump of nothing, but it's called an elephant's foot. Don't worry, at first I was a little worried too, but it has nothing to do with elephants and is only named that because of its appearance. This lump was actually created from the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown, and it is just a mass of corium and other materials that were in the core of the reactor. This elephant's foot was located in the steam distribution corridor, which is under what's left of the reactor. While this mass doesn't produce as much radiation as it did before, it does still, to this day, produce a deadly amount. It is said that if you stood in front of it for just 300 seconds, that would be enough to get a lethal dose of radiation. It's kind of crazy that even though they knew this, they were still standing there taking pictures of it. But I'm just glad because we all now get to see it, and it gives us just a little more insight into what exactly happened that day. In our number five spot today, we have Mount Pinatubo. This is a photo that is showing Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines on June 15th, 1991. That is the day that this volcano erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Certainly impressive, also extremely terrifying. This photo shows the pyroclastic flow full of hot gas and rock being flung into the air. Eruptive activity in the volcano first started on April 2nd of that year, which prompted researchers to set up seismographs in the area. By June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions before, on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent an ash column 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere. After more highly gas-charged magma reached the surface on June 15th, the volcano once again exploded, this time sending the cloud of ash 40 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Volcanic ash and pumice blanketed the surrounding area, and pyroclastic flows filled what were once deep valleys with fresh volcanic deposits. It was truly magnificent and extremely powerful, and this photo shows just that. In our number four spot today, we have the Pioneer's Defense. This photo is known as the Pioneer's Defense, and Man, does it ever look creepy. This photo comes from 1937, and it was taken by a Russian photographer named Viktor Bulla. This photo takes place in the Leningrad area, which is now known as St. Petersburg, which is the second largest city in Russia. The people in this photo were part of a group that was the 1930s Russian equivalent of our Boy Scouts, and it was called the Young Pioneers. The masks on their faces leave a very eerie feeling, and for a fair reason. These people were doing a military preparation drill, which is the reason for the gas mask. This photo was taken during a time where the country was under the dictatorship of Joseph Stalin, and the residents were constantly unsure of what was going to happen. The country was already seeing death, and people were already frightened just a few years before the start of World War II. In our number three spot today, we have the lipstick. This is a photo that comes to us from December 10th, 1945. If looking at this image gives you a shudder down your spine, that absolutely makes sense, as it was written by a terrible person known as the Lipstick Killer. This photo is an image of a note he left written on the wall at one of his crime scenes. The photo comes from the apartment of Francis Brown, as just before he wrote this message, he took her life. After this message was left, he ended up taking the life of one other person before he was finally caught by police six months later. The message scrawled in the photo reads, quote, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. It is an absolutely chilling note with a horrifying backstory. In our number two spot today, we have the acid drum. This photo comes to us from inside the house of another terrible person, the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, made very famous recently. This photo was taken from the inside of his home after he was found out and caught by authorities. Before his arrest, he was sadly able to take the lives of 17 different people. Although this photo might look kind of plain, the horrors are plentiful. This shot shows a drum full of acid that was located inside of his home. Probably don't really need to tell you what it was used for. I can't imagine the horrors investigators saw when they entered his home, and even previous to that as they investigated his crimes. Thankfully, Jeffrey was caught, and in 1992, he was sentenced to life in prison, but just two years later, he was killed by a fellow prison inmate. In our number one spot today, we have the Dyatlov Pass incident. If you have never heard of the Dyatlov Pass incident, you better buckle in, because it is so terrifying. This photo was taken in February of 1959, as nine young Soviet hikers sent out to trek through the Ural Mountains. They had set up a camp, and some Sometime during the night, 
something happened that made them cut their way out of the tent and all flee the site. Leaving in such a rush, they were of course underdressed for the bitterly cold weather and six of them ended up passing away from hypothermia which is extremely tragic. The other three however is where this story takes an even more frightening turn. Like I mentioned before, no one knows why they fled the tent in the first place and the last three hikers were found passed away with severe signs of physical trauma that no one agreed on what had caused it. In 2019, the investigation was reopened and just last year there was a conclusion that a kind of avalanche called a slab avalanche was the cause for these injuries. Before you come at me in the comments, I know that not everyone is convinced that's what happened and I don't blame you. It's really strange. So down below in the comments, let me know what you think. Let's solve this mystery once and for all together in the YouTube comments. Regardless of what happened, this whole incident was of course very tragic, but the mystery behind it definitely takes it to a very spooky place. Number 10, the isolator. The last thing anybody wants to do after the almost, almost two years we've had? Ugh. Though this looks like an object perfect for deep sea diving, it was actually built for desk work. Hugo Gernsback was a Luxembourgish American inventor, writer, editor, engineer, designer, businessman, and of course, magazine publisher, because why not? I'll add one more thing to the list he's really good at. He started a magazine called Science and Invention, which encouraged scientific and amateur experimentation. This was one of the inventions published in the magazine and was revealed in July 1925. The main purpose was to block out all of the noise from the surrounding environment, narrow the field of view like horse blinders to improve concentration. But don't worry, there was an oxygen tube attached to help out the studier, so you know you could you could breathe while you're reading about Shakespeare or something. Number nine, K. Kangaroo boxing. Link here. This next one looks pretty self explanatory, but also it's very confusing at the exact same time. Kangaroo boxing actually became pretty popular in the 1800s. In both Europe and the United States, clowns and professional boxers would square off against marsupials in front of herds of people. It was actually started by a university professor just like as a joke, and then it really caught on. Who they cheered for? One can't be certain. The man in the above photograph was sparring against a kangaroo in Germany in 1924. Obviously, the sport did not continue as it was considered abusive to animals who clearly had no idea why this hairless being was all up in their space and trying to beat them up. I don't understand. This is just ridiculous. Number eight, children shipped in the mail. Picture here. Sounds ridiculous is ridiculous. But did it happen? Of course it did. However, this picture was actually staged, but this actually did happen. Imagine your sister calling you and telling you your nephew is visiting, and then minutes later the doorbell rings and your nephew is just like chilling with some packing peanuts in a cardboard box. Well, not quite. The postman had to play a kind of babysitter a bit. Shortly after package delivery, a revolutionary thing on its own, was introduced, a couple in Ohio sent their infant son to their grandmother's via post in 1913. It cost 15 cents plus $50 insurance. Once this oddball story got out, the trend caught on. Regulations were vague about what you could and could not send via post, so why take a bus when you could take a postman? Rural townships also usually knew their postmen really well, so they'd be like, oh come on Joey, here's 15 cents, take little Timmy to my aunts, I don't know. So they trusted them, they weren't just passing them off to strangers. However, eventually new regulations came out banning the practice. Finally, because it's just weird. <laughs> In our number seven spot today, we have the Boston Marathon. This photo comes to us from 1967, and it depicts the struggles that Catherine Switzer went through in order to be the first female to finish the Boston Marathon. The photo shows race organizers as well as other participants trying to stop her from running the marathon that she had trained for and was more than capable of completing. She has written a book that explains in great detail all of the things she went through that day and how the critiques and opinions about a woman running running the race started even before she had registered to run. People in our history like Catherine are very important as well as photos like these because they show when people were literally trying to drag her down, she just kept on running. In our number 6 spot today we have the reenactment. This photo is extremely unsettling and for a very good reason. If when you look at this photo your instincts tell you that the guy in them is creepy, ding ding ding, you're right. This is a photo that features the German serial killer. 
Joachim Kroll. He is known for taking the lives of 14 people, all varying in age, and he is also known for consuming parts of their flesh. This monster was caught in 1976, and he was discovered when police found out that he had been clogging the plumbing in his apartment with the remains of one of his victims. How gruesome is that? This photo was taken shortly after he was caught and arrested, and what you're seeing is Kroll reenacting one of his crimes for the police. I get goosebumps just thinking about that. I couldn't imagine being there or being the police officer that he's on top of. Talk about terrifying. I'm just glad that they caught him and got him off the street. In our number five spot today, we have the Stanley Hotel. This is a photo of the Stanley Hotel, which is the hotel that inspired the famous Stephen King novel. The Shining. This hotel was under construction in the early 1900s and saw a fateful day in 1911. There was an unexplained explosion that happened in room 217. In the explosion, a chambermaid was seriously injured, but she did end up surviving and she actually returned to work. A few years later, she passed away and ever since her passing, there have been tons of guests who swear that they saw her ghost. Guests have said that they have seen her around the halls of the hotel, but the place that gets the most paranormal normal activity is of course room 217. This is the room where Stephen King and his wife stayed for one terrifying night in 1974. Apparently they were actually the only guests at the hotel for this night, which at any other hotel might be kind of cool, but I feel like this is not what you want from a haunted hotel. In our number 4 spot today we have the Rothschild Surrealist Ball. The Rothschild family is one of the wealthiest and most powerful families there has ever been. For years and years there have been many rooms swirling about just how powerful and influential they really are, and there are some pretty crazy theories out there. In 1972, the family held a surrealist ball, which is where this photo comes from. These photos could potentially be very innocent, but there is just something about these very elaborate masks, coupled with the theories about what this family is really up to, that just makes it feel very eerie. I know it's kind of like conspiracy feeling, but I don't know. There's something very haunting about this. This party is one of the most legendary there has ever been, and whether or not they really are involved in shady dealings, that still is pretty impressive. In our number 3 spot today, we have John Lennon. Of course we all know John Lennon as one part of the Beatles who went on after they disbanded to have a very successful solo career. Lennon was not only a musician, but he was also a peace activist who was strongly anti-war. He was not afraid to display his activism and held a two-week anti-war demonstration. There was a period of three years where the Nixon administration was trying to have him deported for his criticism against the Vietnam War. That's how active he was. On December 8th, 1980, Lennon was leaving the Dakota apartment complex when he was stopped by a man named Mark David Chapman. Lennon signed an autograph for Mark, which is what is happening in this photo, and then Lennon went on his way. Little did he know, Mark was going to shoot him later that night. Once Lennon returned to the apartment complex, Mark was there waiting for him to commit his crime. Mark has said he did it mostly for attention, which is very horrifying, but Mark is also a very religious man who explained that Lennon once saying that the Beatles were more famous than Jesus is what really pushed him to commit this crime. It is very crazy that this photo was captured when Lennon was being so kind to who he thought was a fan, and no one would have ever predicted what would happen just a few hours later. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Hindenburg. This is a photo that was taken during what is now known as the Hindenburg disaster. It is commonly known that blimps, or these kinds of floating airships, use helium in them to float through the air, and it's important to note that helium isn't the choice because it's the only option, but rather because it's one of the safest options, and that is due to the fact that it isn't extremely volatile. Because of a US ban on the exportation of helium at the time, i.e. the Helium Control Act of 1925, although the Hindenburg was designed to use helium, there was a lack of it available, so on the day of the Hindenburg disaster, the much more flammable hydrogen was used instead, and this led to, well, complete disaster. When the Hindenburg floated off on May 6th, 1937, it disastrously caught fire during its flight, with 97 people on board. Sadly, due to the fire, there were 35 casualties on board the flight that day. It is an absolutely horrendous situation, which teaches us all a very valuable lesson. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have Mount Pinatubo. This is a photo that is showing Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines, on June 15th, 1991. That is the day that this volcano 
volcano erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Certainly impressive, also extremely terrifying. This photo shows the pyroclastic flow full of hot gas and rock being flung into the air. Eruptive activity at the volcano first started on April 2nd of that year, which prompted researchers to set up seismographs in the area. By June, the volcano was having a couple of progressively shallower eruptions before, on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent an ash column 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Additionally, smaller explosions continued on June 13th, which then led to some intense seismic activity. After more highly gas charged magma reached the surface, on June 15th, the volcano once again exploded, this time sending the cloud of ash 40 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Volcanic ash and pumice blanketed the surrounding areas, and pyroclastic flows filled what were once deep valleys with fresh volcanic deposits. It was truly magnificent and extremely powerful, and this photo shows just that. I don't know about you guys, man, but like, Mother Nature, I'm afraid of her, alright? <laughs>